Um, thank you for joining us again for another Sips and Trips. I'm just waiting for Tania to join me. And tonight, we are going to be joined by the Wanderlust Mama. And she's going to teach us all the tips and tricks and all of the hacks when it comes to traveling with children. Summertime is live and in full effect. Hey, Safi. Summertime is live and in full effect. And... People are out here traveling with their children. And so she's going to give us all of the tricks that we need, um, the tricks of the trade for traveling with kids. She's going to share all about her experience. So I'm just waiting for Tania to join us. And then we'll go ahead and get this party started. And I see that she's actually already joined the live. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, just give us one moment. Once Tania joins, then... Um, We'll chat for a minute and then we'll bring you and then we'll bring you on. Okay, and Tania is here. I'm just gonna go ahead and um bring her on and then we'll bring um Takesha on. So one second, you know how these technical difficulties go. Hi. Hello. How are you? Okay, honey, I was not ready. <laughs> you did not come to play on today. Girl, I can't even say that. But today, I'm not going to lie, I am drinking lemonade. So, yeah, it's one. Well, I'm drinking air. Because if you guys caught my story yesterday, your girl didn't gain too much weight while she was on vacation and she's trying to get rid of the weight. I've lost four of the pounds that I found while I was on vacation. So we got a couple more to go. So I'm drinking air. But Takesha's ready. Oh. She has already yeah. sent her request. We just gonna go ahead and bring our girl in. Honey, I am she's ready. already ready. So while you bring her in, if this is your first time joining us with Sips and Trips, we meet bi-weekly to simply talk about all things travel while enjoying our favorite beverages. Now, sometimes it's alcohol, sometimes it's not. But Hello. here we are. Hi. How are Hi. you? Hi. Good. Nice to meet well, you all. Welcome, welcome, welcome. First of all, did I pronounce your name right? Is it Takesha? Takesha. Takesha. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Definitely Thank you for joining us tonight. We're excited to talk with you all about traveling with the kitties. Yep, yep just got back and I'm tired. <laughs> so it's real. <laughs> so I know that for most of our episodes, we've pretty much been talking to a lot of people that are single, you know, or that don't have children. So we're definitely glad to have you because we want to make sure that we are catering to all of our followers you know we know travel with kids is a big thing especially with the state of travel right now even thinking about the people that are going through things like being stuck in new york right now because there are no flights i heard about leaving that. yeah oh uh, yeah so we're definitely glad to have you on can you simply tell us a little bit about you and um let everybody know how they can follow you on social media of course, I am Takesha Burton. I am a family travel blogger, also a freelance journalist, travel writer as well. Um, based in Maryland, right outside of the DC area. Can y'all hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Oh, hey DMV boo, I did not realize you were in the DMV too. So I'm down here. <laughs> And um, yeah, so I write about family travel on my blog, but when I'm writing for other people, like when I'm freelancing, I'm writing about just culture because I travel for the culture. So wherever I can find any history and culture, that's, that's what I'm about. Um, my blog is Mama Wanderlust, www.mamawanderlust.com. And um, you can find any of my clips on TakeshaBurton.com if you want to read any of my writing. Love that. How long have you been a, a travel writer? Oh, maybe since, but right before the pandemic. Okay. So I, I have been a writer and journalist for 20 some years. I ain't trying to tell you how old I am. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> okay. So I just kind of merged the two things I love. I love travel. I love writing. And I was able to merge them together with my background and my experience. So I was able to get my foot in the door and start writing. Love that. 
I love that. I'm a travel writer as well, and I don't typically meet too many travel writers and freelance journalists that look like us. So definitely kudos to you. That makes me extremely happy. And tell me Thank again you. where we can find your um the your writing and outside okay. of your blog articles. Oh, yeah. My writing is at TakeshaBurton.com. So that's T-Y-K-E-S-H-A-B-U-R-T-O-N. Um, that's where my portfolio is. So my photography, my clips, some of my clips. I've been writing for a long time before there was like PDFs and stuff, you know. <laughs> I, get it. I get it. Love it. Yeah. So what made you start writing and blogging about travel with children? Okay, so I am a product of a teenage mom. So one of the things I said was I wasn't going to live that life where I had to give up. I knew that, I guess seeing my mom as a kid and kind of grew up together, I knew that she was missing out on life. So I made the point to wait until I was much older to have kids. So I probably had my, I had my first kid when I was 37. And, um, but the problem was I had this idea that in order to have children, I had to die like the old me had to die like pieces of me had to go away i couldn't be a good mom and a traveler and do the things i loved and so that resulted in me having some postpartum issues so i had a little postpartum depression with my first uh child my son and when i finally got out of that fog i felt like i was like when i was ready for my second baby i was like this is not gonna happen no more let me write my way out of this because writing is my therapy so i started writing how-to guides and you know just things that I wish I had for myself, tips and trip, just tips and tricks on how to get around the fear that is very paralyzing if you're afraid to move in the world with your little one. What was the first trip that you kind of took that you blogged about with Ooh. your following? The first big trip was uh, Australia. <laughs> oh, wow. So that was the first big trip with, as a family of four. So we had two little ones. My baby was 18 months old. And that was an 18 hour flight. And we brought grandma. That's my biggest tip too. Bring somebody. Yeah. If I've you can it. afford to, to foot, a, foot somebody's flight, my mom is all about it. If we plan for her flight, she there. So um, yeah, that was the first big trip. Uh, but like I said, I'm not a rich person. I grew up in Miami. And it was like, like, I grew up in a place where the world came to me. So right. that was my first time really experiencing the world was when people came to my hometown. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we couldn't afford to go anywhere other than Key West, Georgia. Um, so I would read books. I'm a, I'm a book geek. I'm a nerd. So I would read books. And that was my first way of traveling. So I don't feel like you have to go far to travel. I truly believe you can really step out of your comfort zone. Anytime you step out of your comfort zone, you are traveling. You are exposing yourself. So if you go down the street, around the corner to the next city, that's travel too. So if you're afraid to do it with your children, start small, like just start with the next county over if that's what you need to start with. Mm -hmm. But if there's something you don't know about next door that you, or in, even in your own hometown, hometown, there's places where you can go and still travel. You know what, why I feel like you feel like that as well? Because as travel writers, we can literally make a trip out of anything. We can find the gyms anywhere. And so that's one thing that we are good at doing. And I hear that. I feel like I'm listening to myself. So yes. what were you going to say, Jennifer? Now, well, one, not just as travel. Well, yeah, I guess, I guess I'm a travel writer, too, because I'm a travel blogger. So yes, travel, yeah. we can, so but I, rem I remember when we were in the height of the pandemic and we weren't really, a lot of people weren't really going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that I started doing was I called it traveling in my backyard. Mm -hmm. And I started finding so many gems just three blocks away, right? Mm -hmm. But that's traveling, right? That's, so that's traveling. traveling three blocks away. Yes. And I think the common misconception is that you have to spend a lot of money and do a lot of planning to travel when really you can just go the next city over because if you really do your research, there are a lot of hidden gems. I found a whole slave cemetery in my neighborhood, right? What? Oh, wow. Yes, it, it, it is such a unique story. I would have to tell y'all about, about it. I want to hear about it. I want to hear about it. I'm going to tell you all about okay. it. Um, but it's such a unique story because, okay, long story short, it was a slave cemetery, right? And then it turned into a brickyard and then they forgot about it and they put a gas station over it in an um, a office building, right? Then they tore oh, it wow. down and they found the, 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 the graves, right? So now here in the city I live in, you can't build anything on top of land until you've done an archaeological dig Ooh, to find out what was there. Before. I like that. But, but 
had I not been just walking around, mm -hmm. you know, bored, trying to find something to do, I never would have found it. And it was right in my own backyard. So when you made a very valid point when you mentioned the gems, but one thing I wanted to say is that there's a common misconception that life stops when you have kids. And yes. Um, I really, what I can really appreciate with your page is that how you have found a healthy balance of traveling for yourself, traveling with your, you know, traveling with your family. Um, what, what else are you doing? What tips are you giving people to keep them from, uh, having that mindset? Whereas I have to choose between traveling with my kids and traveling with, uh, my family. Uh, I think that the one of the biggest things I've been doing is um, letting the kids be involved in the planning process. Oh, that's so now my kids are a little bougie. So when I ask them where they want to go, they talk about Madagascar. <laughs> 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 Everything's cartoon related. If it's a movie, we want to do it. So uh, what is that called? Uh, set jetting, I think is what it's called. Set jetting when people travel for movies and stuff. That's my uh -huh. kids. Except it's cartoons. And we can't afford Madagascar right now. Okay. So... <laughs> I like to get them involved. I like to hear what they want to say. And maybe we don't go to Madagascar. But, you know, when I, when I whittle it down, it's like, oh, we just want to be at a beach with palm trees. Ah, Miami. I can do that. <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> so I get everybody's buy-in. I think that, that's the, uh, the biggest thing, to get everybody into it. Um, I think as far as uh, your mindset, I think you, like I said, you have to try baby steps because it is overwhelming. You do have to think about a lot. And, and Unfortunately, as a, a black mom, I have to think about other things as well. Like I was just talking to somebody the other day, like I want to do a road trip, but there's some places I don't feel comfortable with having my black husband driving. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So there's all kinds of things I have to consider as a mom, as, you know, as a woman and mom, we are the planners. We the, we're, the, we're the trip planners. Mm -hmm. So we have all these considerations that we have to take into mind. So it's a lot to, to, to think about. So I know you talked about like planning and kind of taking baby steps before your big trip. Mm -hmm. Australia for me, one of the reasons why I have not been is because I'm I I'm not ready for that flight. Like I've traveled a lot, <laughs> I've taken I think my longest flight to date was getting to Bali simply because of Ooh. the layover. But yeah, it it was amazing, but that flight is kind of brutal. Um how, how did how you was feel? that flight? So honestly with the layover it ended up being about twenty seven hours. Then you can do Australia. You can do it because mine was twenty eight. Yeah, the, yeah. I, I say it was like twenty, and my husband said he's gonna divorce me if I do that again. Yeah, I didn't enjoy that flight though. Like, I'm not gonna lie. Like, long flights for me are brutal if I can't sleep the whole way. Like, oh, I really yeah. want to sleep. I don't want to watch TV. I'm gonna drink the box wine every time it come by. <laughs> I'm gonna take a couple of sleeping pills. I'm gonna figure it out because I need to be sleep. I don't want to watch movies. Yeah. I want to go to sleep and wake up there. So. So when you talked about baby stepping your way up to that, how did you baby step your way up to taking yourself and your kids and your family to Australia? Well, we just, um, like I said, I'm, I'm, fr I'm not from here. So we travel a lot because going home means at least a two hour flight because I don't do road trips. I I'll do road trips, but it can't be too long. Mm -hmm. I got to be there. If, it's, if I can't get there in six hours, I got to fly. Okay. So uh, we're flying to Miami because my entire family, in Miami, except for my mom who moved with, in with us during COVID. So we're going to Miami every quarter. So my kids got baby steps with Miami. So, and it's not, okay. a, it's not a real, to them, it's not a real trip. It's just going to see your cousins. Right. Going to see your great grandfather. You know, it's, it's family. It's home. Miami is, you know, a place where people go party. But for me, it's where I get my collard greens and cornbread. Right. That makes sense. So they had little baby steps with these smaller trips. And then we'll get in the car. We live in Maryland. So we'll get in the car and drive down to Williamsburg. We love to go to Williamsburg and pick up the okay. history there. So little small steps, uh, smaller trips. And then at one point, we just, I was tired of these little short trips. I was ready. And I just, we did the plunge. And the only way we could do it was to bring grandma. So we paid for her flight. I, I found a cheap flight. And when I say cheap, cheap uh, flight to Australia from the D.C. area, I think it was like $600 per person. That's reasonable. I, I think so. It's like, I think one of the airlines are opening up a new direct like a direct flight or something, some new way they were doing it. It wasn't direct. It was like a stopover somewhere, but um, it was a new route. And that's why they were promoting it that way. Okay. But I got my mom in on it and she helped us. And all we did was walk the child up and down, up and down, up and down. And I always have a couple of things I do. Um, I'll go to the dollar store, right? And I'll grab a whole bunch of toys my kids have never seen. Like, it don't matter 
it's, if they are dolls, they don't care. It's a new toy they've never seen. And each toy, I have it in a bag. They haven't seen, it's like a surprise bag. I put like a little paper bag, you stuff it with a bunch of toys and you let them open it. and it can take out one thing like every hour. That keeps them preoccupied for at least a couple of hours. Then um, I have a new movie. I'm all about technology. I thought I was gonna be one of those moms that did not allow their children to watch TV and on the screen time and all that. Uh -uh. Now I got kids, it's a totally different situation. Get on the iPad and be quiet, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> I'm just keeping it real. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> so I'll download a new movie they ain't never seen. And, you know, I just try to keep it new. So if it's a long flight like that, somebody's going to have, somebody's going to get cranky. I mean, I probably was laying in the aisle screaming at some point, but we, <laughs> we worked it out. <laughs> So for that Australia trip, how did they do? Because that was like their first real long haul flight, right? Yeah. Okay. My son did well. Um, my daughter was not so much at 18 months i remember us walking up and down the aisle a lot like as long as she could walk she was good so we just did a lot of that it was a lot we took turns so it was my husband my mama and me and it was just like we were just a team we would just take turns walking back and forth my son was fine he's really low key he's low maintenance he just wants a new some candy some cookies anything sweet because i don't just i don't give him the sweets often so i use that as like my that's like my little go-to oh you want some candy because they don't get candy every day it's like a it's like a special treat okay got it and so even outside of the flight with that being the first long haul trip that you guys took as a family what was the entire experience like with them how was it for them how was it for you guys what did you feel like was the outcome i think well first of all we have a family member who lives there which is one of the reasons why i went he was a military my, my cousin was in the military fell in love with an aussie girl and just stayed and has i was able to meet cousins so it was like a little mini family reunion I remember not realizing that my children would have jet lag. So we got, got there and I was sleepy and I was ready to go to sleep and they were wide awake. Cause it was, I mean, so I don't know why. I think I'm a really, I'm a really good at planning, but for some reason that escaped me mm -hmm. that this would be an issue. Them being on a totally different time zone. And we just had to rough it. We roughed it through, through it. And they eventually got caught up and then we came home. Same thing. <laughs> Same thing. And what is this like uh, for every, our difference is the day. So for every day we stayed, they got acclimated to the time almost halfway through because we were there for a very short period of time. It was like seven days we were there. Okay. And um, yeah, it was like we had, they had just got right to the halfway point and then it was time for us to come back home and then we had to sit up with our eyes burning <laughs> awake again on the way at home. So it was, it was, it was definitely hard it was there was difficulties and my my 18 month old does not remember it but i remember it, it, was, it these are my memories too these are our trips too so we can't wait for our babies to get old enough to remember it because we can make the memories and we can tell them about the trip these are our trips this is our life our lives too i mean kids matter but parents matter too oh definitely i appreciate mm -hmm. it. oh go ahead i'm sorry go ahead no go ahead no, I was going to say, I appreciate you saying that because we hear parents say a lot, well, they're not going to remember it, so I'm going to wait until they're older for me to be able to take them. And that's fine to a certain extent, but if that's preventing you from living as well, why not figure out a way to take them? So I appreciate you for saying yeah. that. Yeah, especially when it's free because after yeah. two, they ain't going to remember that, but after two years old, they're a whole person. You got to pay a whole seat for a whole seat. For sure. So take but advantage while you can. But you're also giving, showing them pictures, right? So yes. when they're five years, they might not remember it. But when you show them at five years old, like when you know when you were a baby, we took you to Australia, that still gives them a, a, a memory. Like, mommy, can we do that again? You yes. know what I mean? Yes. Just from them looking at, the, looking at those pictures. Um, what resources or what research did you do in preparation for y'all's first uh, trip? Because Australia that 20 hours is no joke. Did you do a lot of research from other moms? I did a lot of, I did a Pinterest dive and, and looked at other people's blogs. Cause I'll, I'll be on there looking to see what other people are doing. But I do know that one thing, I, okay, so I travel because I want to know the unknown, right? You can read all you want, but it's something that you're going to find out when you get there that you never knew. Mm -hmm. So one thing I did not know, I don't know why, cause I, when you travel in Australia, if you don't have a car, if you need an Uber or a taxi with a baby, they won't let you in their car. You have to have a car seat. Oh. So imagine, you know, like think about like you in New York and you have your baby with you. You just jump in the taxi, I guess. But there's like a special taxi service you have to call that has its own car seat. 
So there was a lot of times we were stuck places because nobody would give us a ride. So, mm. and, I mean, it's like you never know these things until you actually experience them. Like in Paris, we were just in Paris last summer and there were five of us when we took my mom and you can't get a ride with more than four people. So we had to get two taxis in where we went. Yeah. Wow. I think so I was from Paris as well. Oh, you said you had that experience as well? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was definitely. like, can, can somebody sit in the front? Like, can we just... <laughs> They were and like, no. I've also noticed even in some places in the States, like when you get in, where was I at recently? The front seat, you have to all fit in the back seat. So what they'll do is they'll have the front seat pushed all mm -hmm. the way up where nobody can ride in it. Where did I just, I just experienced that somewhere. I've seen that before too. I think it might've been New York. I've seen that before too. I was trying to think too. of my Ubers. Really? It was, mm -hmm. Where have I been recently? It was somewhere I've been to recently, and I was like, "So nobody can sit in the front," and they were like, "No." And when you, make I plans, know for a minute it was like that here. Oh, I really? know last spring. I know last spring it was definitely like that when we um we were I had, my family came into town. We were downtown, and we could not find anybody that would take four of us in a in an Uber. Yeah, and you don't know, and it's like same thing. Um, you could I think I don't know if the laws just change as you go or you just get there and you find out like I went to Argentina and I didn't know Ubers were illegal. I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> oh, they, they, were, they were Ubers. Too. They were Ubers, but they yeah. weren't. <laughs> I even tell people like we are so accustomed to being able to mm -hmm. call an Uber, but there are some places where catching an Uber is extremely dangerous. Yeah. Bali is one of them. Really? Wow. The taxi companies have been boycotting Uber, and so they literally will physically attack drivers over there for Uber. And so mm. a lot of times when Uber drivers pick you up, they'll have you walk to a side street or walk somewhere where they're least likely to have to deal with issues from the taxi yeah, that's drivers. Nice. So I also, crazy. in Mexico, you know, we all feel like in Mexico, but when you go to Cancun, the Uber drivers are really, um, taxi drivers fight against the Uber drivers because they feel like it's cutting into their livelihood. Mm. So in Mexico, okay. sometimes it gets a bit, I know in Cancun for sure, it can get a little dangerous catching Ubers as well. Okay. Yeah. You also have to watch out for scams when it comes to these taxi drivers yep. in Mexico. I got, I got scammed while I was there and who really? knew? Yeah, and it had to do with my transportation. Yeah. Oh, you have man. to be very, very careful. I'm I going to be honest. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, go ahead. I was going to say, I travel. I, before I became a mom, I was a you know, solo traveler. So there's a lot of things I do differently with kids. Like this last trip we took last summer, I paid a lot more money because I was bringing my mom and my kids and going to a place that I was kind of like this about. But we went to Egypt. So I wasn't mm -hmm. sure like what we were getting into. To, I didn't feel like trying to even try to really learn Arabic. Some things I can try and I, I can speak Italian. Uh, from Miami, I can speak a little Spanish. I put yeah. a little accent on it. It's Italian. Arabic, we can I make can't it. help nobody with. I can't. I cannot. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. yeah. My kids were better at picking up stuff than I was, but I was trying to make sure my mom with her knee issues and then, my, you know, I just wanted to make sure we was good. So we paid extra money to have somebody with us all the time. Mm-hmm. And I think about that. That's important because the likelihood of you getting scammed as a tourist with a taxi is extremely high in just about wherever you go. And I know all of us have been solo travelers. You know, the three of us have been solo travelers. Yeah. And as a solo traveler, I like to know that I'm in an Uber, you know, yeah. or something like that. I'm not as comfortable taking taxis. But one thing I do when I have to take a taxi is I have my hotel or my resort call them for me so that they can mm -hmm. choose somebody reputable good, good, but if good. i come up missing they know where i came up missing from okay that's good good that's good yeah i like that because they typically have certain ones that they call and they keep track of it and so yeah. at least you know they'll know but I, I definitely think it's a good point you made how did your kids do with egypt because i don't even know how i did when i went to egypt it was high. not good Good child, not good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's happening? Right, okay, so you know how you, have, you have your kids, even if you don't have kids, I don't know if y'all have kids, but your mama done had a conversation with you about how we going to act, okay? <laughs> how we going to act when, we, when you see the food, you're going to smile. No, the kids was not with it, okay? So we did a homestay. I was so aching for travel that I wanted to be immersed in it. I didn't want to stay in the five-star hotel. I wanted to stay. We stayed in a homestay right outside of Giza. So our guide was also a homestay person. And also it was like a whole family business. Um, 
and my kids just they couldn't get their face together when the food came i mean it was they were just looking like what <laughs> it was like i was like this is really healthy mm, mm. no they weren't with it at all they didn't know and we went in july <laughs> so it was hot, but it was cheaper. <laughs> of course, I'm a baller what? on a budget. <laughs> yeah, I went in July too, and let me tell you, did I you almost went... die? <laughs> huh? Did you almost die? Like I did. did. It was so hot. You know, I'm from Houston. Well, right now the heat index, and I'm in New Orleans right now. We are okay. stepping outside to hundred degree temperatures. I can do hundred degree temperatures. So when I being from Houston, I thought I could do anything. But by the Never time we got to like our third pyramid, I'm like, this sand is hot. It's really hot. Yeah. And so it was 117 <laughs> degrees. And I hate to sound like this is going to sound so bad. But I was like, look, at this point, I'm hot. I'm getting irritated. All these pyramids look the same. <laughs> we can come back tomorrow because I'm not going this cute. But I'm yes. not going to make it. Yes, that's exactly what it was. My son, he's, he's, lighter than, he's lighter than the rest of us. And I was just looking at his face and he just broke out in hives. His face was red, like these red splots on his face. And I was looking at him at one point. I was like, nah, he don't look right. He got a <laughs> I just started pouring water on his head because he just looked like like he was about to pass out. I was like, it was 115. We were in the Nubian desert. It was just not. And they we they smiled for the pictures because they're they're my employees. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They were like, we ain't going back. But it was a beautiful, wonderful experience. Like, they learned so much. Like, mm -hmm. they did not know Egypt was a part of Africa. My mama really? didn't know. My mama didn't know. She was like, we're going where? And then she started doing research before we left. And she was like, this is a part of Africa. I was like, yeah, mom. Yes, we are going. <laughs> I would definitely say I had some surprises going to Egypt, too. I knew it was a part of Africa. So I expected the people to look like me. Oh, I knew that, but that was not. Mm -mm. <laughs> That's not what it was. And then also one thing that I found that was really neat is that when you get into the pyramids, even with it being so hot outside, they were cool. You know, the temperature cool. was actually cool. nice inside of them. Negative. Sorry. That I was, was dying. Was your experience? No. I have a video yes, of you like literally cool. melting. No, melting. my pyramids were cool. Well, yeah. I had a good experience with that. But I also feel like one thing that when did you go to Egypt? I went last July. Okay. So I went 2019, 2018 okay. before COVID. Okay. One of the things that made me nervous, especially when thinking about um, bringing kids, is you can feel the unrest. You know how they're checking for bums underneath your car and like you know that they're getting ready to build places like New Cairo and then mm. knowing that they've had, you know, um, some political issues yep. within the past few decades egypt is a bit unstable and you kind of feel it and so how do you choose destinations to go to with your kids like um kind of with the craziness after covid with knowing that places are having political issues how do you kind of navigate that um i generally don't go to places uh that have issues at the time i try to avoid them um, they were somewhat stable and I chose a person who was connected with the tourism board and it kind of helped that they knew I was a journalist. Sometimes that's not a help. Right. I'm telling you. Right. Um, but like when I was going to China and they were like, you're what? No, no, ma'am. <laughs> I almost didn't get a visa oh. to China because they found oh, wow. out I was a journalist. But uh, he was connected to the, the tourism, the Ministry of Tourism, and they knew everywhere we were going. They knew all of our stops. That was important to me. Because, um, and you know, I'm, I'm American. I, I, I do register my trips with the State Department. I want you to know exactly where to come get me at. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I'll be like, American. <laughs> yeah. But um, I, I'll, I'll say that. that I, but I don't generally do anything that is, I feel like that was a little bit more unstable. Because I think when we went to the Nubian Desert, we were somewhere near the Sudan border. And it was a lot of military checks. Yeah. And it was, it was, it was, it was very interesting. My husband chose this destination without really, he's not a traveler. You know, he, a, he a Washingtonian through and through. He really never left the country until we got married. He's, uh, he's cool with it once we're gone, but he really was like, like when we got there, it was kind of like, a, why are we going through all these military stops? And I had to explain to him like, uh, right here is where this is. And over here is, you know, Syria. Mm -hmm. He was like, what? 
<laughs> so it's kind of like a question of pearls moment, but he was like, okay, we're in this. We're going to be good. The, more, the other one thing I really had issues with was, um, you know, kids act up everywhere they go. They're going to keep it real, 100. And when you're in certain countries, you cannot, as a woman, discipline your children or talk to oh, wow. your children. At least that was my feeling. I know that someone else, I talked to another journalist and she was like, that was not her experience in Egypt. She lived there and she was like, no, these women are loud and they just cuss, you know, fuss their children out. But I definitely felt like I couldn't snatch nobody up. I was, <laughs> and you know, it was a thing. Like they, my male child was very popular and they were like, because, because we were in a home stay situation, they were like taking him places and I was like uh I had to send my husband because it was like uh they were taking him to get a soda it was very fa familiar familial it was very family centered but I I'm still visiting so at some points it was a little uncomfortable and I had to have my husband step in because I couldn't I couldn't really I didn't feel comfortable saying anything I mean I would have said something if I had to but I just felt like it was a something else yeah. going on there yeah okay thank you, you know like I mean? they respected, your husband, like, respected the males yeah. more than right you. Yeah. Okay. That's, Even as my son, like my son yeah. was, a, you know, he's here and I'm here. Right. That, that's something that, to be honest, I don't have kids and not just Jennifer, but I don't think that you would think about that, especially like until you've actually experienced it with kids. You know, there were certain things I experienced as women travelers, as because mm -hmm. I went with my two sisters, so there were certain things that we experienced as women travelers, but I didn't even think about like things like that. But I can say this with kind of the more family environments when i went to turkey i was in the airport i don't know if i told this story before but i was getting ready to fly from istanbul to cappadocia and um when i was getting ready to fly from there i was in the airport it was a woman she had two kids she had a toddler and like maybe a six month year old the toddler was doing a lot like he was sliding around the airport <laughs> like he was doing a whole bunch she really needed his hand pop <laughs> and so she needed to go take the baby into the restroom. And now we didn't speak the same language. Um, she was a Turkish woman. And we were just kind of going, um, we were kind of communicating back and forth, like, you know, things like that. She left me with the toddler while she went to go change her baby in the bathroom, you know. And I'm like, he, but it, it wasn't communicated verbally, but she asked me if I could watch him for a few minutes for her to go and change the baby. And me and him was sitting out there, but I was also thinking, like, his mama needs to come get him because he kind of bad. Like, and I didn't even <laughs> tell him, come here. Like, come hither. But it was nothing, you know, and she obviously felt safe enough to do that, but I don't feel like it was something outside of the norm. Right. So my son got a little, he, he started feeling himself. You know, he was with the other little boys and he started feeling himself. And uh, they were doing some things and he thought he could do those things. So we had a situation where I was looking at him like, boy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all I could do is like get my husband, like wave him all like, because uh, I mean, this little boy was acting like he was grown. He it was eight at the time. And I guess he was running around with the other little boys because they're like little men. Mm -hmm. So he was like feeling herself and i was like boy you gotta go home with me don't don't do that don't get down here and get confused he got so, real confused his daddy had to straighten him right on out what are some destinations that you would recommend for parents that are just starting to travel with their kids some Ooh. international destinations Ooh, international. or domestic destinations that are like gyms filled with kids to do things outside Ooh. of like disney okay so I really, really, really love Williamsburg, Virginia. I know, I guess I'm not, I just love all the history that's there. There's a lot of water parks. You know, kids might not be into history, really. They don't know they're learning, but you can make it fun. So I really like Williamsburg. That's like my go-to, uh, just quick little road trip. Um, I felt like we, after we left Egypt, Paris, we went straight to Paris on the way home. And that was really like a breath of fresh air because it's very similar to what we're used to. The... I mean, they didn't have air conditioning. It was a heat wave. So we went from one hot place to another. But um, it was just real chill, very family centric. Um, and my, I, I, I mean, I know things are different now, but one of my favorite places in the world is Hong Kong. Um, it's not the same as it was when I went years and years ago, but I love Hong Kong and I've always wanted to experience that with my family. So now that it's, I think it's SAR, it was SAR at the time, and now it's full Chinese now, right? So I don't know if I'll be able to 
go. But I also am dying to get my son to Tanzania. When I went there, I was I had never I didn't have a I didn't have a husband, a family. It was just an idea in my head. And I went to the most beautiful place I've ever seen in my life. It was in Gorongoro Crater. And it was the most beautiful place I've ever seen. Even to date, I've been to all seven continents and it's nothing touches that crater. And I remember crying. It was so beautiful that it brought tears to my eyes and I just started praising God. Like, thank you so much for making the place so beautiful. And I remember thinking at that time, years and years before I ever had a family that I'm going to bring my son here one day. And and I'm going to bring my children here one day. I want them to see this. It's like the glory. It's like the it was so beautiful and even like somebody asked me if antarctica was the most beautiful place i've ever seen and i still say nope i want to hear about antarctica (laughs) yes definitely but first let me uh, kind of piggyback on what you said about going to um tanzania because i went 2021 um everywhere during COVID was pretty much shut down because of COVID, but they were one of the places that really did not have like they had like a zero percent fatality rate for COVID. when i got over there they didn't even think that COVID was real like they thought that it was all media stunts and things like that but you were able to go over there you didn't have to wear a mask all you wow. had to do was get your temperature really? checked and hand sanitizer it was like wow and so a lot of travel influencers found going to zanzibar in tanzania um during COVID, and we started off with if you ever go to tanzania i recommend doing a safari we did the Serengeti and the Gorongoro Crater and uh, then Zanzibar. The Gorongoro too, Crater, we had spent um, like a few days in the Serengeti and we saw some amazing things, but we actually got to see a lion kill in the Gorongoro. Like, wow. And then we got to see what? A lion kill a zebra. What? And wow. then some hyenas, a herd of hyenas tried to come in and fight the lion for mm-hmm. the zebra yep they gang- let me tell you they gangster yep the lion was like we ain't doing this like <laughs> the lion ran all like four hyenas off and then he called his she called her back up because typically in lion packs it's what i learned is the females that yeah. kill but i think that going to africa in general just wherever you go whether you're going to egypt i've been to egypt johannesburg cape town and tanzania and I feel like that's how you know that God is real because mm. there are some things like that you see that you're like, there's no way you can think man created this, that this just ended up here. Even going nope. to Zanzibar, there's nothing really dangerous in the waters around Zanzibar. The most they have are octopus that are deep down. So when you go snorkeling, you don't have to be really worried about anything. That was the best and clearest snorkeling that I've ever seen. The only thing I've seen that's comparable is the Fifi Islands in Thailand, but we talked about that before on Simpson trip. There's all kind of debris in the water. There's trash. Zanzibar's water is pure. So while I want people to go, I know that they really can't handle substantial yeah. tourism. Yeah. And I just hope that the beauty of the place is always preserved. preserved. Because, Absolutely. Yeah, it was, I want to go back. It was amazing. You know, I, I went there and I guess it was my first trip and I haven't been back other than Egypt to, to the continent. But I, um, I was looking for myself. And I didn't see myself there. I felt like, I don't know, I just didn't see, I thought it would feel more like see my reflection. Even when I first got there, somebody said caribou and welcome home. And I just started uh-huh. crying because I was like, this is for all my ancestors. You cry. I just started crying because all the people who didn't like make caribou. it back. Yes. But when I went to Zanzibar, I was like, oh, that's my cousin Charlie. Oh my gosh. I guess because I didn't realize that we were so mixed up. I guess I thought, I, I, I guess I had not put it together that as Americans, we're the hybrids. Yeah. Uh, but when you go to Zanzibar with the mixture of the different colors and cultures, it, I looked, I saw like two cousins and an uncle. Uh, I was like, uh, oh. Sitting on the corner, sitting on the yeah, corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. It was a wonderful experience. And I really want to share that with my kids. Yeah. I could see that being amazing. When I went to Johannesburg, so me and my sisters, the trip that we took was Egypt, mm-hmm. um, Johannesburg, Cape Town, and then we went to Dubai. When we got to Johannesburg and they kept telling us, welcome home, like you felt it in your chest. Like yes. going, to, so, going to Soweto, to Nelson Mandela's house that he was raised in, like it's a feeling that I think every black person needs to yeah. experience in their life is what it's like to go home. Yes. At least at least one time. At Egypt is not home. Do it's not be home. like me. They don't look like us. Between you and Mercedes, I I I don't think I don't think Egypt is for me after <laughs> <laughs> I 
both <laughs> both of you. Yeah. But you know, I remember going to um Stellenbosch in uh yeah. South Africa and taking a picture at the winery, right? And when I look back mm -hmm. at this picture, it's like I can't even believe that that is real. Yeah. Yeah. What you know what I mean? You haven't taken a picture, and it's like it doesn't even look like this could be real. Yeah. Like the Cape of Good Hope, like even when like you are, um, we did the Cape of Good Hope and then we did what's the um, road around the rocks that you go through where it's like one of the most scenic views. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to put it in my story. But like it makes your heart, heart flutter even just thinking about it. Like, you know, we can only trace our history back as Americans for so long. So yep. being able to go to these places and also there is something about knowing that apartheid was within our lifetime. <laughs> And yeah. seeing them flourish and knowing that we are Americans and we still can't get our stuff together. It's, yeah, <laughs> put Africa on your list if you haven't yeah. gone and go to South Africa or Zanzibar, Tanzania. But there are some places that really make you appreciate your culture. Yeah. Antarctica, though. Okay, that's <laughs> the one I want to hear about. How'd you end up in Antarctica? Uh, like I, when, I, when I was starting the blog, I knew that I wanted to do the opposite of what I did with my son when I was ready to have my daughter. And I, I said, um, well, what happened was my cousin, who uh, had been battling breast cancer, her breast cancer came back. And I remember reading about these people who go to Antarctica. It's always been on my list. And they, they just, people do it as a, a bucket list item and they're older and retired and they can't experience, they can't really enjoy the experience. And I remember thinking, well, first of all, that was a whole like midlife crisis for me, my, my cousin getting sick. It was kind of like a, a, a reality check that everything people told me, I did everything I was to do right go to the right school do the right thing the 2.5 children i did everything and it seems like it was all a lie right so it's time to start doing things i have a dog here running around i'm trying to do i decided to do things my way and stop waiting for permission so even though i had a baby at home <laughs> i called my mama up i said mom can you come take care of this baby i found a it wasn't a cheap it wasn't cheap um, but I worked out a deal and I made payments. So I made like three payments, like three installment payments you can make on your, on your trip. And that's what I did. I decided not to wait. I didn't want to wait anymore. I didn't want to wait for the perfect time and the perfect. So after having my baby girl, I said, uh, I think it was like, she was two, maybe two years old. And I was like, I'm ready to hit my seventh continent. I want to do it. It's on my list. I don't want to wait till I'm too old and I can't enjoy it. And that's a lot of what I saw. There are a lot of people on those Antarctica cruises who have the have the money. They finally have the money because they're retired now, but they couldn't even get off. They couldn't even get off the ship. They couldn't get on the little um, what are those boats called? The little boats you, you take once. And some of them were able to get on it, but people had to carry them, and they couldn't get off of it to even touch touch ground. I didn't want that experience, so I decided to live louder, live bolder, and that's how I ended up going there. I went ahead and did it. It was a wonderful trip. It was beautiful. And my husband, you know, uh, he asked me, he's like, aren't you concerned going by yourself? I mean, you're not going to know nobody. And I was like, I'm going on a ship full of people who are going to Antarctica. This is probably their seventh continent. So these are my people. Right. Like, these are travelers. I'm assuming you're open-minded and a good person. And, you know, I'm making a lot of assumptions. But for the most part, these are my people. Right. Uh -huh. And it really was that. It was really that. Like, it was wow. a lot of cool people who were just... Have, wanting to have the same experience. And it was like, you have this, it's like going to school. You know how you go to, maybe you go to study abroad or something like that. And you all are encapsulated in this one experience and you're mm -hmm. having it at the same time. So it built like a camaraderie and a brotherhood and a sisterhood. It was just a beautiful, beautiful experience. What was your favorite part? It sounds amazing. What was your favorite Ooh. part of it? Our favorite parts, because it's hard to narrow it down to one. <laughs> I think my favorite part was overcoming my fear and jumping in the water. I did the polar plunge. Oh, I was so what? afraid. I was so afraid. And I was like, I, I always say, I say to myself, I did not come this far just to go this far. And I was standing on that thing. And I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And I found an older black couple. They were amazing. They were an older black couple and they just adopted me. And she took a video of it and she was screaming my name. I didn't hear her at the time. She was screaming my name from the top of the ship. And when I jumped in, I saw her video later. <laughs> A whale had just breached like seconds before I jumped in. Had I seen that whale, I would not have done it. <laughs> oh, God. For people that don't know what the polar plunge oh. is, can you explain what the experience is for them? Okay, so the polar plunge for my ship was we were in the middle of the open ocean. Uh, I forget what was 
one of the seas, but uh, in Antarctica, the water's freezing cold. There's icebergs everywhere. So imagine it's like jumping into a glass of ice cold water. <laughs> so some people do it a different way where you can run out into the water from the banks of the, uh, the land. You can run in. I would never have done that because as soon as the cold water touched my foot, I probably wouldn't have gone all the way through. So it's, I would jump into the ocean. You're tethered so, that, so they won't lose you. Um, but that was the saltiest water I've ever tasted. It was so salty. So I guess because it's so pristine or because there's so much life in it. I don't know. It was very, very salty. But it was so cool because as soon as you jump in and you come out, your entire body's tingling. I never felt more alive. It's like my, all my skin was tingling. They give you a shot of vodka coming out. It was just, you get a polar plunge, a uh, little uh, badge. It was fun. I'm glad I did it. What kind? What did the air taste like? I know that's a weird question, but what did the air taste like? Because there's nothing Ooh. there. I'll tell you this. I don't know what the air tastes. I know the air smelled horrible because all the penguins, it smelled horrible. Really? Horrible. You can smell the penguin colonies from miles away. They smell so bad. Um, so it smelled like ammonia and poop, I, I, bird poop. Ooh. It was horrible. But oh, I'll tell God. you what I didn't know had sound. Silence. Huh. I mean, to me, it was so, I had never really heard silence. And the only thing I could think of to, to describe it is like, if you go underwater really, really deep and you just be still, that's what it sounds like in Antarctica, above water. Wow. It's completely silent. And I remember looking when I first came out, we first got there and I went on the deck and I looked and I was, I'm from Miami, so I'm used to the world being flat and I'm looking and I see this, the, you know, I see the mountains, right? And they're uh, magnificent. And I see the clouds. And I kind of lean my head back and I realize that the mountains go way above the clouds. And I'm just like still going back. I had never seen a mountain range like that in my life. It was the most beautiful thing ever. Like it was gorgeous. I can tell that you're a writer because the way that you're <laughs> describing this, I can see it. Oh my. Yeah, but thank I'm you. Thank you. Not, you're right. You still have to get off of here. Oh. <laughs> Can you tell um, the people that are watching our live right now kind of where to find you again and what kind of content you produce so that they can know? <laughs> okay, so if you're finding me on Instagram, I'm the Wonderless Mama. Yeah, Wonderless Mama. And uh, on, the on the internet, I'm mamawanderlust.com. Most of my content is going to be about family travel, how to incorporate your kids, multi-gen travel, because I take my mama with me because that's my homie. Um, <laughs> so that's what I do. But if, if you, if you're catching me, uh, you're trying to see what I write for other people. So I write for several other outlets. I write about culture wherever I find it. Cause I'm always searching for the culture, whether it's, um, African American culture, African culture, indigenous people's culture. I'm always looking for culture when I travel. That's why I travel with my kids so they can learn in a fun way. So if you're looking for any of that, my writing is at TakeshaBurton.com and it's T-Y-K-E-S-H-A-B-U-R-T-O-N.com. I have my portfolio up there for my um, photography, which is a new hobby I picked up during the um, pandemic. <laughs> and that's me in a nutshell. We absolutely love that. So before we wrap up for the night, if you had to give moms some tips about traveling with their kids, just some generic tips okay. what are the tips you would tell them and what advice would you give them okay same uh my tips would be number one let the kids get invested so they feel like they have a say so even if it's just even if they can't pick the destination let them pick something like an activity that way they, they're invested in it and they might act a little bit better knowing that you know they're they're a part of it uh let them pack their own fun bag everybody has a book bag they pack their own favorite two, one or two toys um, give them a surprise bag, a goodie bag full of dollar store treats. That's one of my favorites. Um, bring a family member or friend. Always have snacks and drinks. Uh, let go of the screen time rules and let them have fun. Download a new movie, new game. Anything new is going to give you time to breathe. Those are my tips. <laughs> Love that. Are there any destinations you would warn moms to kind of think twice about taking their kids? I am not that kind of traveler. I okay. think it's up to whomever. I think it's become it's all personal. Um, okay. Cause what one person might feel is a horrible place. I might love. Um, yeah. So I don't know if I would say don't go somewhere. I say okay, level do your of research. Difficulty. Ooh. What type of like, where do you need to go as an experienced traveler? 
experience i would say egypt was definitely experienced you have to yeah that was hard uh, i think asia in general was hard for me as even as a single person i never went with my family but being in china backpacking for 16 days and having to get people crowd i, I remember running away from so many people trying to talk to me because they hadn't seen people who look like me and they want their kids to practice their english with you so it became a bit much after so many days the otherness becomes too much sometimes yeah i agree I definitely agree. <laughs> so I haven't done it with kids. I think the most I've ever experienced was it was a lot of uh, kids from Korea when we were in Sydney and they kept stopping and I was asking why were they so enamored with my daughter? Like they were trying to touch her. So somebody explained to me that they don't have little black people there. Like they've seen black people before grownups, but not children. Mm -hmm. So that was a thing. And I was like, okay, but it was the touching thing. I was like, oh. Yeah. So, you know, you, you have to look up uh, people's cultures and understand what you're going to run into when you get there. Give us three resources aside from yourself okay. for uh, that you recommend for families who are planning trips. Okay, say it again. You broke up. Three, three resources mm -hmm. um, aside from yourself uh, for families to um, to utilize when planning travel. Okay, so if you're going internationally, I always say the State Department. State Department. Look That's it up. Okay. Make sure. Make sure that figure out what the rating is. Make your decision based on that as far as what safety is. I personally don't feel unsafe. Most places I go, I feel like we're the middle and the majority. I'm not afraid of people who look like me. I don't know. That's just me. Um, uh, definitely State Department. I really love, um, I love Monet Hambrick. So um, The Traveling Child. I love her blog. Yes. I love The Traveling Child. Yes. Great. I love her and I love, um, what's it, Kim? The mom trotter. I love, I love her stuff. I also like Travel Babo. Babo, he's a white dude in California and he does a lot of uh, photography. I love his photography. I love some of the stuff, he, the tips he gives. So those are like a couple of other bloggers that I, I really follow and I like. Thanks. Something you mentioned um, a little while ago, well, during the begins, we talked about when you were, we were first starting to travel. I think we all started traveling kind of before it became an Instagram thing. <laughs> Pinterest used to be my go-to i was gonna get on pinterest and read everything put together travel guides it's still a resource for me and yeah. people really look at pinterest sometimes for just fashion and stuff but the knowledge you get off pinterest for a lot of things is invaluable especially when it comes to travel because that's where i found some of my favorite travel influencers and bloggers have been on pinterest. i believe pinterest is the number three search browser in the world i think it's number yeah. three mm -hmm. i could believe that because yeah. it's amazing it is wonderful it's very powerful for sure well, we definitely thank you so much for um, joining you. us for tonight. Me. It was such a good time. You shared so much valuable information, and we appreciate that. We definitely are looking to have more inclusive guests like mom bloggers because that's important because kind of like you said, I don't have kids. I can only tell you what I read, but there's something different actually having to visit destinations with your children and navigate the unknown because mm -hmm. that's essentially what it is. Um, and so thank you for coming on and sharing. Thank you for having me. This is great. This is fun. So good night, everyone. We will see you next time. Have a good, good night. night. Have a good, good night. night. Thanks for joining.